Hello and welcome to another in our video series on demystifying IFRS 9's impairment requirements. I'm Sandra Thompson, I lead our global accounting technical function for financial instruments and financial services and I'm here today with Mark Randall. Hi yes, I'm Mark Randall, I look after the banking practice within our UK technical function as well as working with many of our global clients. Today we're going to talk about what banks should be thinking of disclosing in their 2017 financial statements, so before IFRS 9 applies, and also peeking forward to what would we think banks should disclose through 2018, both in interim financial statements and in other communications such as transition documents. So I'm going to kick off talking about 2017 financial statements. Now the first consideration is what does IFRS actually require? IS8 requires information about known or reasonably estimable possible impacts of new standards, and IFRS 9 is clearly there. But I think banks need to go beyond what the standard says and also think about what a regulator is expecting to see, and indeed what the information is the market demanding. Now, a number of regulators has, have, have indicated they are expecting to see quite extensive disclosures by banks in 2017. One of those is ESMA. It's not the only regulator, but the European regulator ESMA has particularly indicated this. It's just issued its common enforcement priorities for 2017 and new standards is top of the list. In addition, ESMA did a quite useful study where they looked at 48 European banks and what they've disclosed either in 2016 financial statements or through to June 2017 interims. Now, I should say that study looked only at financial statements it didn't look at things like analyst report and other communications. What that study showed is in that period, 80% of the banks had disclosed something, and about two thirds of those had given something that was entity specific. But of those, only 20% had actually quantified the impact. And the way they'd done that quantification was very varied. In a lot of cases, it was ranges. Sometimes it was the impact on equity, sometimes the impact on capital. So you can see banks are beginning to give some numbers to the market, but they're quite varied. So what extra are we expecting to see in 2017 year-end financial statements? Well, a few things to note. First, I think the disclosures need to be bank-specific, not boilerplate summaries of what IFRS 9 says, but really explaining to the reader what is the impact on this particular bank, what is the biggest effects for them. Secondly, I say think about all aspects of IFRS 9. For many banks, impairment is the biggest impact, but not necessarily always the case. There's classification and measurement to think about, and there can be some key judgments there, and also for some banks, hedge accounting too. The third thing to think about is quantifying the impact. A lot of regulators and the market are increasingly communicating they expect a number, they expect to understand how big the impact will be at transition. Now, for some smaller banks, that might be a challenge, but certainly for the bigger banks, that's what we're expecting. There's no one right way to quantify the impact. You might think about a range of metrics. The impact on opening equity is one possibility, and that, of course, is an IFRS number. But certainly the market is very concerned about the impact on capital, so that's something to think about. And things like the impact on tax or cash impacts as well. So think about a range of metrics, not just one number. And then finally, any number that's put out in the financial statements needs to be audited. So do think about involving your auditors early on and making sure they are prepared to give the degree of comfort you need. So that's 2017. Mark, if we move on to 2018, can you take us through expectations there? Sure, yeah. Sandra, I guess as you said in your introduction, there's two aspects to think about here. Firstly, interim reporting that banks might be doing under IS34, for example, their half-year review. And then secondly, certainly some of the larger banks are thinking about putting out a separate transition document in advance of Q1 or their first interim reporting, really to set the scene for users and analysts and investors for this new IFRS 9 information they're going to get. So I guess the next natural question then is what are the requirements that apply here? And actually there's very few, so judgment's going to be required. All IS34, the standard around interim financial reporting really says is that when there's been a change in policy, then there should be a description of the nature and effect of that change. And then if you're doing transition document, that's a voluntary document. So 
There are no particular requirements that apply there, but generally speaking, the objective behind issuing that transition document is to give early sight on the IFRS 7 disclosures that otherwise users would only see uh, in the 2018 uh, year-end annual financial statements. So typically speaking, aligning those disclosures in some way to the requirements of IFRS 7 is going to be a sensible step to take. And then lastly, I think something also to be aware of is whether, again, local regulators or listing rules or exchanges, whether they have any rules that are applicable to that particular reporting. If so, they clearly also need to be taken account of. So having said that there's judgment required, what are the sorts of things we might expect to see? Well, when we've been discussing internally with clients, I think there's four key areas that I'd highlight. The first is accounting policies. Most banks simply will never have published their IFRS 9 accounting policies before, so people are going to need those to understand what's going on. And in particular, where there are policy decisions, what were those decisions? The second will be the reconciliation of opening to, or closing to opening net equity. What were the measurement differences that arose upon transition? Thirdly, is the reconciliation between the stock of um, loan loss provisions under IS39, bridging that to IFRS 9. What were the moving parts within that? And then fourthly, and very importantly, what were the critical judgments within the overarching uh, implementation of IFRS 9? I think naturally people will think there about multiple scenarios, significant increase in credit risk in the context of impairment, but I think what's important also is not to overlook any critical accounting judgments that were necessary when implementing the classification and measurement requirements, as they too can potentially have a really significant effect. In addition, if there are any other particular disclosures which are really going to be pertinent and relevant to your organisation, I think it makes sense to add in those as well. And as part of that, I think most banks are communicating with investors having a dialogue with them. So if there are particular areas of emphasis or interest from analysts and investor community, I think it really makes sense to take account of those and reflect on how you might incorporate those into your either your interim reporting or the transition document. The last thing I'd really focus on is timing. Uh, in the, in IFRS 9, timing is generally under pressure and I suspect this will be no different. So for that reason, really trying to plan ahead what are the various communications that will go out to the market through the course of 2018, both in terms of interim information, interim financial reporting, transition documents, and any other communications, and really making sure they fit together, that the timelines are in place, so that that information can be pulled together, but importantly, internal due diligence can be done so that those numbers are trusted, and also external auditors can be involved at the right stage to avoid last minute surprises. Thanks very much, Mark. So just to recap, this is a key area for banks to be thinking about, both thinking in terms of what the standards themselves require, but also regulatory expectations, and indeed what the market is asking for. The bank needs to have a process for thinking about what it disclosed in 2017 and then through 2018 and how those communications build and really help investors understand the impact of IFRS 9 and bridge that gap between IS39 and IFRS 9. For many banks, adopting IFRS 9 will be the biggest accounting change for maybe several years or decades and really helping users get to grips with what the changes are and be able to understand them is going to be key. Thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye.